You may know Sammy Diamond for his uplifting yet filthy bass tunes under the LS Dream Project. Or maybe you've been lucky enough to attend a Light Code Sound Bath Live. Perhaps you're familiar with his former twonked out trap project by the name of Brills. Clearly Sammy has been a busy man for more than a decade, but what if I told you that these projects are just the tip of the iceberg? The history of his music goes much, much deeper, and his life story is worthy of a blockbuster biopic. Everything you will learn in this video will give you a deeper understanding of how a lifetime of grit and resilience led to the creation of one of the most standout bass acts of the present day. It's a story of getting knocked down time and time again, while always getting back up to fight for a better future. Every failure brought its lessons, and every success presented new challenges. His story shows us that life is a never-ending quest for growth, but whether or not you choose to accept the challenge is up to you. Let's take a trip back in time to see where that story began. Sammy Diamond entered this world on July 4th, 1981 in Israel. He moved to New Jersey with his parents when he was five, and they opened a coffee shop slash diner. Sammy's grandmother was a Holocaust survivor, so she made his parents promise her that they would enroll him in a Jewish private school once they got to the US, and they honored her wishes. One of the many interesting things about Sammy is that he is fluent in Hebrew due to his time growing up in Israel. Sammy and his friends would hang out at the diner after school and his parents would give them free food. It was a time in his life that he looks back on fondly. He took up an interest in music early in his life and his love for electronic music began at just 5 years old when he heard 8-bit video game music. He would go to garage sales with his parents on the weekends, but rather than being interested in any of the toys, he would find broken instruments and beg his parents to buy them for him. You know, I grew up like pretty poor, so we'd go to garage sales and I would like buy like shitty guitars and like little <laughs> broken Casios and stuff. And I just think playing like Nintendo and stuff, being like a little kid, just getting the gear for like electronic music, I think that was really like the start. He amassed quite the collection of instruments that had seen better days and he taught himself how to play them. He also loved drumming, so he would use pots and pans to make up beats on the fly. His early musical tastes, aside from electronic music, included hardcore, punk rock, heavy metal, and underground rap. He also loved skateboarding and inline skating as a kid. Once he learned to play the guitar, he found himself taking up an interest in classic rock. He would celebrate his love for music by going to record stores and buying new vinyls for his collection. By the time he was in middle school, he had become disillusioned with the Jewish faith that he was raised in, and he wanted to go to public school. He began acting out in school as an attempt to get out, and eventually, it worked. He told his parents that it was only going to get worse if they didn't put him in public school, so they obliged, and he went to public school for 9th through 12th grade. During his time in high school, he made a lot of friends, specifically ones who were into music, and others who were into skating. He was a drummer in a few different bands, but was later introduced to DJ culture beatboxing, and dancing, which led to his discovery of rave music. It all started when he saw one of his skateboarding friends dancing by his locker. I'll let Sammy tell the story. I was walking down the hallway and I saw one of my skater friends doing like liquid at his locker. And it just like mesmerized me. I was like, what is that? He's like, oh, it's liquid, man. It's like rave shit. I'm like, the fuck is that? <laughs> He's like, we're going to the city this weekend, New York City. You're in Jersey? Yeah. yeah. Took me to my first rave. That was it. That's how I got into it, from like the dance element. Going to raves in New York became a regular thing for him as soon as he got his driver's license. He immersed himself in the dance side of the scene and became friends with other dancers that he would meet at raves. After high school, they all formed a dance crew named Liquid Pop Collective, and they were the first dance crew to ever put out a liquid dance tutorial. Section 1. Technique Advice Before we address any of the concepts within Liquid, we will be going over a few things that we feel will help you develop into the best liquid dancer that you can be. First and foremost, it is of the utmost importance that you remember liquid is a dance. Contouring. To make or shape the outline of a figure, body, or mass. To contour is to make your liquid run the shape of an object. The objects themselves can range from imaginary geometric shapes to actual physical objects, and on to, of course, the most commonly used object, the human body. This was before social media was a thing, so they had to set up a website, publish the video, and then promote it on message boards. Through all of this, Sammy became interested in production, and he started making music for the dance crew, as well as for his own personal enjoyment. 
Now this next part isn't relevant to his journey with music, but it was too good to leave out, so here it goes. After high school, he had a high paying job that only required him to work Saturdays and Sundays every week, which allowed him to focus on music the other five days. And guess what that job was? He would do sham wild demos at Walmart in New Jersey, and he could make up to $1,000 a day doing it. Here's the clip from Willie Joy's podcast where he talks about it. Check it out. There's a company called As Seen on TV. Yes. And they make products, like I infomercial am products. I with this company. One of them's called Sham Wow. Do you know about this? Oh, I know. I know. And Basic now that you say it, I've, you've, told, you've told me something about this okay. before, but I want the whole story. All right. So there was a company in Jersey. They had the license to sell Sham Wow. They were the ones doing the infomercials. And they got a partnership with Walmart mm. to set up a booth in Walmart and do a 10-minute live presentation of ShamWow in the middle of Walmart. Right. And I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I had to learn a 10-minute script, right. straight-up infomercial. Right, like live infomercial. Fucking button-up black shirt with the ShamWow logo on it. <laughs> He goes on to talk about the manipulative sales tactics he was taught, and he feels bad about it, which I definitely understand. But honestly, at least ShamWows have actual utility, and he wasn't peddling some sort of scam. I think we've all done something at some point in our past that we aren't proud of, but if we learn and grow, then there's no need to beat ourselves up over it. I just think it's such a fascinating part of his already ridiculously fascinating life, and it's pretty funny since ShamWows were such a big thing at one point. But anyways, let's get back to the music side of things. Now around that same time in his life, the band that he was in started to gain traction locally. They became the go-to band to open for big acts coming into town such as Linkin Park, Limp Bizkit, Deftones, and many others. Once they got enough recognition, they were offered a record deal and flown out to Los Angeles to record. Unfortunately, egos of some of the band members got in the way and things ultimately fell apart. It was at this moment that Sammy realized if he got good enough at producing, then he could have his own project which he would have full control of. Around that same time, his dance crew Liquid Pop Collective also fell apart, so he didn't have much going on. The producer for his former band became his mentor, and he taught him how to use Pro Tools and record bands. After Sammy got the hang of things, his mentor hooked him up with a label job recording for one of their artists, and her name was Sarah Hudson. He worked with Sarah for about a year, but the label ended up imploding, so they were both left high and dry. But over the course of their time working together, they had become good friends, so she convinced him to move to Los Angeles with her to start a band, and that is exactly what they did. Sammy's mentor bought him a plane ticket and gave him $1,000 so that he could get started in LA. Together, he and Sarah started an electropop band called Ultraviolet Sound, and they later added a third member. Somewhere along the way, Sammy and Sarah fell in love, and they began dating. Life wasn't easy for them, and they were illegally living in a recording studio for two years, which didn't even have a shower. Both of them refused to get jobs so that they were able to focus all of their attention on music. They would do various production work for other artists to make ends meet, but funds were still very tight. Every day, he and Sarah would split a Subway sandwich and eat cookies for dinner. Though eventually, they were able to save up enough money to get a studio apartment together. Shithole apartment. At the time, their band was struggling to get bookings because they weren't exactly a band, but they weren't exactly DJs either. They were somewhere in between. But eventually, things started to turn around for them. In 2008, when Sammy was 27, they released their debut album called OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Dancing. Adidas Originals sponsored the album, and they garnered a total of 135,000 digital downloads. They started getting booked for some DJ nights around LA, and through this, Sammy met Kill the Noise. Sammy thought it was cool that Kill the Noise could just show up with a backpack and play a show, whereas his band had to load up a van with their gear. This sat in the back of his mind for a while until it culminated at one certain moment, but I'll get to that in a bit. Ultraviolet Sound was active from 2006 through 2012, releasing two albums, one EP, and three singles. During that time, they were able to achieve some degree of success musically. Their 2011 single Girl Talk hit number one on a list of top 40 songs released on independent labels, and it got radio play from over 50 top 40 stations. 
they got booked for some random one-off shows with major artists like Lady Gaga and Katy Perry, and they were brought along as support on a few tours. Now, all that might sound great, but Sammy and Sarah were still struggling financially, and even with all the new exposure, the band wasn't really gaining any traction. On New Year's Eve at the end of 2011, Kill the Noise gave Sammy a pep talk and convinced him that it was time for him to start a solo producer project. New Year's, I was with Kill the Noise, and I remember, clear as day, he gave me this pep talk. He was like, bro, it's time, dude. Like, stop talking about it and just fucking do it. Just fucking be selfish, do you, and fucking do it, you know? It's like, you've, yeah. been, making, you've been working on Ableton for a couple of years. You've got the skills. What are you waiting for? You and know? who better to give that who, speech than I Jake? mean. I'm a lucky dude for having that friendship. So he and Sarah decided that it would be better if they both did their own projects because two chances at making it were better than one. Not long after that, Sammy took a two week trip to Thailand, which was where he birthed the idea for Brills. He visited various temples and he was getting into spirituality around that time, which was his source of inspiration for the project. It's a pretty interesting part of his story because it was the same inspiration that birthed LS Dream, but we're gonna get into that later. It was there in India that he came up with the early elephant branding for Brills, which seemed pretty fitting because his signature squeaky sounds were very reminiscent of elephants. I went on a two-week vacation to Thailand and visited temples and did some backpacking and just traveled and came up with the name and came up with the brand. And if you remember, the early Brills brand was a Ganesh elephant on top of the Brills logo. I do remember that. And the first song I put out started with like rainforest sounds and this orchestra, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and you would work the elephant noises in yeah. there too. Yeah. And when I created all that, trap wasn't like trap. Yeah. Like I wasn't thinking about that. It wasn't like terminology. Like it was because like I was, in my mind, I was just making dirty South hip hop beats with like weird noises. For, right. You know but it had a very spiritual like core. He loved Dirty South hip hop and he realized that no one was blending that with dance music at the time. So he decided to take that direction musically. Pretty soon after, he released his debut track, which was a remix of Kill the Noise's song Roots, which incorporated lush rainforest soundscapes. It was such a fresh new sound at the time, and people were excited about it, so the project gained traction very quickly. His next release after that was a collab with Etc. Etc. called Bueller, which sampled Yellow's song Oh Yeah, that was an iconic track in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. They made it in one day, and etc. etc. sent it to Diplo the very next day, and he immediately told them that he wanted to sign it to Mad Decent. That was around the time that the Brills project really took off and became his full time career. He mentioned in a podcast that he made the decision to pursue music full time in 2004, but he didn't make any money from his artist projects until 2013 with Brills. So obviously, the early Brills era was a very exciting time for him as the dreams that he had held onto for so long were finally being realized on a large scale. He had caught a wave and he was riding high. But over time, he was slowly losing himself and losing touch with his original inspirations for the project. Brills was becoming more of an extension of himself or a crafted persona of sorts. It was being influenced by external factors and success and it began to lose its spark. He was struggling with addiction as he was using substances to distract himself from emotional pain, which was something that he had actually been doing for a very long time. All of these internal conflicts that he was experiencing was pushing him towards something greater, it just hadn't been actualized yet. In 2017, five years into the project, it became apparent that he was pushing for change. He wiped his Instagram clean and he began posting abstract videos with long captions and it was evident that he wanted to rebrand to inject new life into the project. If you want to go take a look at those posts, he still left them all up on his Brills Instagram. Everything that he says in the captions of those pictures show that he was clearly going through something and that he was pushing for a breakthrough. He was talking about a new album that was coming soon, which he actually dropped one single off of called Aliens. It's very different than other Brills tracks and it showed that he was longing for a new creative direction, but the album never actually came. 
He had begun his journey into sobriety and healing, as well as getting back into spirituality, which was revealing a new purpose for him. In 2017, he broke the news to his team that he was shutting the Brills project down. He had nearly a quarter of a million dollars worth of gigs lined up for the year, and he likely would have gotten more as time went on, but he chose to walk away from it all. He knew that he was being called to something greater, but many tests were on the path ahead. He was going through a period of upheaval, and it probably felt pretty dark for some time. However, he also had a monumental moment that he can surely look back on fondly during those dark times. In September of 2017, he married his longtime girlfriend Sarah. Personally, I think the story of their love is endearing, how they stuck by each other's side through everything. I mean, they had already experienced being together for richer or for poorer, and for better or for worse, before they ever even said any vows. I know I haven't talked much about Sarah in this video since it's about Sammy, but she has had major success herself, and they both were able to lift each other up along the way. She's now a Grammy-winning songwriter, and I guarantee that you've heard at least one song she wrote, but you've probably heard many of them. I just think it's such an incredible story how they met and they stuck together through thick and thin all this time. They've both played massive roles in each other's success, and I want to make sure that I didn't understate that in this video. If you're interested in learning more about her specifically, just Google Sarah Hudson Songwriter, or you can check out her Instagram at Sarah Hudson XX. She's equally as fascinating as Sammy, I promise. So after shutting down the Brills project, he began to work on new music while simultaneously working on himself. He spent a full year at home producing new music, ultimately creating about 40 songs in that time. He also became enamored with Carl Jung's theory of the shadow ego, which are the darker parts of ourself that we repress in an attempt to avoid acknowledging their existence. Repression of the shadow ego will cause it to lash out in unconscious ways. All the shadow ego wants is acknowledgement and acceptance, and once it has that, then it will no longer lash out. Sammy began meditating and making gratitude lists every day, and he was learning to accept all of the aspects of himself. He felt that he was discovering his true self while shedding away the burden of fear. Once he was ready, it was time for him to channel all of this into a new project so that it could spread throughout the world. Some things must die for new things to be born. And so, now it's time to take a new journey and for a new trip to begin. I'll see you on the other side. Sequence initiated. Three, two, one, zero. And thus, LS Dream was born. Now, LS Dream was originally intended to be an album title for Brills, but Sammy realized that it needed to be its own project. Now you might be wondering why he chose the name LS Dream after he had already gotten sober. There's a few different reasons behind the name. First off, it's an ode to transformative psychedelic experiences that he had had in the past. He said that psychedelics can show you what is possible for a brief moment, but afterwards, it's up to you to put in the work if you want to live in that state consistently. Secondly, he's interested in the intersection of science and spirituality, which LSD is the perfect representation of. It's a chemical compound that was created by a chemist in a lab, yet the results can be very spiritual and profound. Ultimately, he wanted LSD Dream to be a representation representation of his authentic self, which is where the inspiration for Brills originally came from, but over time it became more of a character that wasn't really authentic to himself. He had become more in touch with his true nature at the start of LS Dream, and that is what he has continued to express for the last five years. Once the project was ready for launch, it got the stamp of approval from Liquid Stranger, and the debut LS Dream album called Voyager was released on Wakan in May of 2018. He had to build the project from the ground up, and he actually lost money the first year of the project. He had to pay for things like visuals, content, and album art, which were costing him more than he was making at the time. He got a few festival bookings early on that basically just paid for his flight and hotel. He would have an early afternoon time slot with no VJ, but he had to start somewhere, and he believed in the potential of LS Dream. 
Aside from releasing the album on Wakan, Liquid Stranger helped the project gain exposure by taking Sammy on tour with him early on. Over time, the project was gaining traction and Sammy continued to release great new music. At the end of 2018 and the beginning of 2019, he released a total of three singles off of his sophomore album. The first of those three singles was called Shadow Self, which was an ode to the stuff about Carl Jung that I was talking about earlier with the Shadow Ego. The song ended up being used in a commercial for the NFL, which gave him massive nationwide exposure. In April of 2019, just 11 months after he had dropped his first album, he released his second album called Renegades of Light. That same year, he released the single called Spaceship, and he also released a joint EP with Schlump called the Universal Wub EP. In 2020, he released Space Funk with Z Trip, and he also began doing a series of COVID live streams called Rave Cave. In 2021, he released his third and most recent album called Peace, Love, and Wubs. Last year in 2022, we got three singles. Blasta with Enzo, Badman with Ganja White Knight, and Funkonaut with Grizz. Now those are just all the official releases, but if you head over to his SoundCloud, you can hear various mixes, live sets, remixes, and some unofficially released originals. If you haven't heard them, I highly recommend checking out Rain Song, Carry Me Home, and Halfway to Dawn. They're incredibly soothing and beautiful. Obviously, he's been putting a ton of effort into LS Dream for the past five years, but it isn't the only project that he's been working on. In 2020, he introduced Light Code, which is a side project that focuses on meditation music, sound baths, and guided meditations. I actually did the Right Here Right Now guided meditation this morning as a way to get into the spirit for this video. He has done a few sound bath and guided meditation live streams, as well as actual live sound baths at festivals. One thing that I haven't mentioned yet that I think is a cool aspect of both Ellis Dream and Light Code is his wife's involvement in the projects. She's done vocals on many of the LS Dream tracks and Light Code Guided Meditations, which further solidifies the fact that LS Dream is a representation of his true self. Since she has played such a big role in his life, I think it's really cool that he incorporates that into his projects. Now as far as things that are on the horizon for LS Dream, he's going to be headlining Red Rocks for the first time on October 12th with Dream Rocks. The next day he'll kick off his Radical Audio Visual Experience Tour in Salt Lake City. The tour will have a total of 35 shows with support from artists like Enzo, Black Carl, Chimura, and many others. We haven't gotten any official LS Dream releases this year, so maybe that means that his fourth album is on its way soon? I suppose we'll just have to wait and see. Sammy's journey through life has had its fair share of incredible highs and devastating lows, but the breadth of those experiences have shaped him into a truly inspiring person. His career reminds us that all experiences are temporary and they all will pass on one day, so we should enjoy the good times and learn from the hard times. We should always strive to reach our potential, but be forgiving with ourselves along the way. All of us have lightness and darkness within us, and to know the full power of our light, we must also know the darkness. I'm going to end the video with a short clip from a video that Sammy posted on Instagram talking about the things that he did that opened up this transformation in his life. If the video resonates with you, I highly recommend watching the full thing on Instagram. I think back on that journey and all the tools and all the things that influenced me. And I gotta tell you, number one, number one, two, and three, I changed my diet. So much of that food out there, fucking poison. You don't realize what it's doing to your fucking whole being. Your vibration is just getting, get, it's, like a, it's like a prison for your vibration. And it's like designed, it's designed to make it your idea. First thing, like, I remember changing my diet. It gave me a little bit of a boost to do some of this other work. Gratitude. Hands down. I don't care what anyone says. Gratitude is rocket fuel. Vibrational rocket fuel. When you do it every single day, a, a list. Like, you, got, you, can't just be like, you can't just be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful every day. Like, I'm grateful for this. No. It's like homework. You got to sit down with a notebook. Write them. Talk them out loud, morning, night. Let's go. Number three, meditating. I'm telling you, you don't need to know the answers. You don't have to figure anything out. You do those three things 
you're on the right track.